Hello. Um, is everybody in? All right. Give you a few moments to settle down. <sighs> All right. You can see that, right? So the topic is offensive content, which gives me the ability to use offensive content on stage. And I'm not amongst one of those to pass that opportunity. So I'm going to use a lot of filthy language today. Uh, and I'd be justified in doing that. So uh, <laughs> all right, let's go ahead. All right, so that's the official title. After the disclaimer, detecting offensive messages using deep learning, a microservice-based approach. So briefly, I'll run through the abstract again. This talk is going to cover the science behind it and also talk about some implementation details. So we're going to talk about the scientific method used to detect offensive content. It's basically, and um, we're going to talk about how we're going to serve that using a microservice, right? <coughs> Time for a shameless plug. Um, I'm Ali Zashan, Ali. I use that name because it's a very long name. People find it hard to use it, so I go by Ali. Uh, I'm from India, but I live in California. I'm a machine learning engineer and researcher by profession, and that's where the shameless plug is. I work at Pivotus Ventures, and we're hiring. If you want a job, reach out to me. Um, all right, let's get started. All right, so what the fuck is this, right? What the fuck am I talking about? Um, it's an automated system that lets that you know lets you as moderators or as providers of a platform. Um, Language on your platform, right? Why is that important? Um, trolling, cyberbullying, uh, very relevant issues. Very uh, did they for the they're bad not only for the victim but also from a business perspective. Like Twitter in 2015 reported that a lot of users were actually leaving the platform because of abuse, because of untackled abuse. And since then, a lot of things have changed. Um, According to the legal structure in the European Union today, um, you, platforms are supposed to, are ob obliged to remove offensive content in an organized manner within 24 hours. Or I would say they're legally obligated to do that. And failure to do so can get fines up to 50 million euros in Germany. So now this goes from being a luxury to a necessity, right? So let's see, let's look at one way of doing it, right? Or, or a few ways. Um, one that worked best for me, but that by no means is the best, absolutely. Um, so let's explore this in detail. All right. All right. There's been a bunch of approaches around. One of the most trivial ones is to try and filter it using a list. Right. Um, uh, that diff gives you an idea of how effective uh, list-based filtering <laughs> approaches are in practice. Um, so let's look at them. List-based approaches, filtering approaches fail because they do not capture context. Um, profanity can be used in a positive context, right? And you can be, so like, you're bloody awesome, uses bloody, which is bad. But the meaning of the sentence is not bad, right? So it fails to capture context. Uh, a filter-based approach or a regex filtering will trigger that, like, will, you know, will not be able to distinguish between the two. The same thing about I hate Mexican food. Now, if you look at stop words list, stop word list for English US, Mexican, the word Mexican by default is a bad word. So <laughs> I, have, I have come across stop word lists available on the internet which are in which the word Mexican by default is a bad word. So now you say I hate Mexican food or even hate, just get the word hate out, put in a positive emotion. I love Mexican food, by that logic, will also get triggered off as offensive. Now, you see serious limitations, right? Uh, so context is hard to capture using a filtering, list-based filtering approach. Um, second reason why they fail is because of alternate spellings. So now, the word bitch, right? The word bitch can be spelled in two different ways. Like, two different ways that I've shown. There are many other ways, but I've shown two different ways. Um, there's a Spanish 
cuss word that I put in there? Hijo de puta. Any Narcos fans here? Yeah. yeah. So you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> and then the N word, which has been written rather creatively. Again, that's going to pass your stop word test because there's no way you can use regex to get that out. Now, you look at shit. Look at the word shit. Even if you use like uh, wildcard matches, if you use a wildcard match there for I, you're going to end up the filtering out stuff like shut, right? Which is a very relevant and acceptable word. So it kind of is not very effective. Like even wildcard matching is not very helpful. And alternate spellings are hard to catch. <sighs> Number three, list based filtering approaches fail because they do not capture the idea. Um, now, in, in a list, there's only a certain number of things that you can put in. You can put in, let's say you put in, um, you put in certain words, right? But to say something bad, you do not have to use bad words. I hate black people. Four words. Each word perfectly acceptable. But when you put them together, the total sense that it makes is not acceptable, right? So this is going to pass through your list-based um, filtering system. And then sexist messages like that. Women belong in the kitchen. Again, perfectly acceptable words. Each one of those words by itself individually is not bad. But when put together, the sentence has a horrible meaning. And that's not something we want to encourage. So we need to have a system that's robust to that sort of stuff. So in a list-based system, uh, <laughs> as you can see in that GIF, what happens is you come up with a set of rules. And then when you, are, when you have to update, you come up with a different set of rules. And then more rules, and more rules, and more rules. And eventually, what ends up happening is you end up creating this tower of rules that's really brittle. And one new rule is going to break everything, like that Lego block. So this is a real problem. And it's not maintainable. So we have to look at something else. So what do we need to do? We need to capture context. We need to be robust to alternate spellings. And we need to classify on the basis of an idea and not just the utterances. Right? These are the three things that we need to do. Now, how do we go about doing And like, in a sense, when these three are put together, it means that we're trying to understand. We're trying to basically get a computer to understand human language. Right? Now, how do we get a computer to understand human language? Can a computer actually understand human language? Um, how do you think? How do you think we can do that? Any suggestion? To understand? Somebody say blockchain, please. Uh, <laughs> how what? Natural language. Natural language. Can you read our? Natural language. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And of course, if it's not blockchain, it has to be AI, right? <laughs> what? Hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, <coughs> how can a computer understand? So we're going to use natural language processing, aka a specific instance of that, deep learning, right? Let's see how it's done. So deep learning is basically like a, like a rocket ship. Andrew in one of the four. Um, did I get that right? Did I get the Chinese last name right? Or did I butcher it? I'm pretty sure I butchered it. Andrew yeah. Un. Un. Yes. All right. Andrew Un. I'll I, I probably never will get the tones right. But uh, all right. So he says, one of the forefathers of deep learning, uh, one of the leading figures in deep learning, said that deep learning is like a rocket ship, right? Where the rocket frame, the, the, rocket, the model is the rocket frame, and the data is the fuel. Right? So it is powered by data. To get it to do any work, we need data. Right? So we're go at this, in this solution, we're going to look at what data sources or how, how are we going to structure the data and what data sources are we going to use, and how are we going to make use of it to achieve our purpose. So before all the shiny stuff begins, before all the cool stuff begins, um, there's a certain things that we need to know. So we need to be very deterministic about what do we, do we want it to just take out, filter out abuses? Do we want it to just take out offensive language? If offensive language, what are the boundaries of, you know, what is offensive and what is not? Like, is, does us, like, to give you an example, like, what might be appropriate on Facebook Messenger 
might not be appropriate in a customer and agent user setting, right? So you need to be very definitive about what is abusive and what is acceptable. Once those, clean, um, when those, once those clear boundaries are drawn, we need to figure out then, we need to pick the data, the labels and you know, your records and labels accordingly. Um, and this is a very important part of the process. This is probably more important than the classification algorithm you use. Because machine learning systems at the end of the day are not magic. Machine learning is not magic. What it does is it has the garbage in, garbage out problem. So there is no free lunch. I hate to break it, break the illusion, but there is no free lunch. So what, you, what goes in is what comes out, right? Um, there's caveats to this. Um, there's caveats in the sense of bias. So um, when we were building, building out this system, um, we used data sets available in, in the public domain. And we found, we came across interesting problems. Um, the, the way the data set was created was they, they scraped people's Twitter accounts. And there was this one Twitter account which was just you know saying stuff about Muslims. Um, and it was like, all right, scrape all the tweets from this account. And anything that comes in is labeled as bad. Now, that is a very terrible way of doing things. Because even like the classifier that was trained on it, the very mention of the word Muslim would trigger it off. So if you say, I am Muslim, and that would, be, get, that would get classified as offensive because your, the data was structured in such a way that even the mere utterance of the word Muslim would make it go all crazy. So it's very important to choose your data sources. Like, again, it's the garbage in, garbage out problem. It's, it's an interesting, manif like, it's a manifestation of the garbage in, garbage out problem. So we need to be very careful about the way in which we choose data. Um, there's other data sets which, you know, scrape the account of the presidents of the United States of America. And anything that he says is garbage. Um, <laughs> now, while that may make sense as per a belief system, in a very literal sense, it's not true. Because he may say stuff like, hey, what a good day today. And if your classifier is taught to learn that as offensive, you have a So the point here is to get rid of the implicit bias of a data set as, you know, as much as you can. Curate your data sources. Do not rely blind, do not blindly trust the data that's available in the open source domain. Go through it like, go through the, like, you don't, well, I'm not advocating that you go through each entry, but have a brief idea of how the data set was built. Now, when we took that data set out, and then when we put in data sets that were labeled using a consensus mechanism of mechanical Turk workers, the performance was much better. So implicit bias, when you're building a system that does any sort of text classification, I'm using offensive content as a, as a use case, but any text classification, is, or any machine learning problem in, in general, it's important to make sure that the data set, know your data, is what I'm trying to say. Make sure it's free of bias. And this creeps in, it's pretty sneaky. It won't come in, you won't, if, like, if you've neglected the process of looking, like if you've neglected looking at how the data set was built, this is gonna creep in at the validation and testing set, and it's harder to fix once you're down that road, once you're that further down the process. So it's very important to choose a data set with minimal bias. All right, now I've made the disclaimers. Let's go ahead. How do we use the data? We have sets of sentences which are labeled as bad or good. How do we possibly use this, right? Um, that's what Neymar is doing. He's like, huh, how do we use it, right? Very simple. Everything is turned into numbers. Um, let's see how. Sentences are split into words and characters. Each word is represented by an array of numbers. Uh, or I would say each word is represented by a set of numbers, which is an array, right? which forms an array. So each word is an array, a single dimensional array. So you, um, not a single dimensional array. Yeah, single dimensional array, or whatever you pick, whatever system you pick to represent. Um, and each character is represented again as a set of numbers. Mm -hmm. 
how do we represent words as numbers? <laughs> Valid problem, right? How do we represent words as numbers? Um, we use something that we've seen in a couple of talks until now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we use word embedding models. Now, the, dimension, the exact dimensionality of your arrays, arrays will depend on the word embedding model you use or the word embedding scheme that you use. Uh, some pre-trained models are word to vec FastX, Glove. There's a bunch of others. Experiment with them, feel free. Um, we've used word to vec and I'll, I'll speak about word to vec in this example. All right. So what do word embedding models do exactly? They, they, assign, they assign values or numbers to a given word in a high dimensional vector space in such a way that similar words are grouped together. That's the basic idea. Without going into the depths and the nuts and bolts of it, the basic idea is that words that are similar, uh, as, as seen in the previous slide, words of a feather flock together. So basically, like similar words are put together. That's, that's all you need to keep in mind for this of word embeddings. So word embeddings can, are structured in such a way that they can satisfy vector equations like, like the ones given there. King plus man is equal to queen plus woman. And if you look at that word, it'll, cause, it'll be very close to royalty. So in, in a sense, word embedding models let us do arithmetic on the word vector space in a semantic manner. So keeping into account semantics. Similarly, in the second example, there's going to be Ireland plus Dublin, Dublin minus India on the other side, the word, the, the sum total will correspond to something close to capital. All right. So we've represented words as numbers. How do we represent characters as numbers? This is fairly simple. Use one-hot vectors. Um, do you guys know what one-hot vectors are? How many of you know what one-hot vectors are? All right. So. I'll explain what it is. Um, a one-hot vector basically is a vector of zeros in which just one digit is set to one. And, and, and the column that's set to one depends on the character that it represents. So let's assume, for, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume a, a vector, a space that is um, 26 characters long. Each corresponds to one letter of the alphabet. and then. The vector for A will have everything 0, but the 0th index set to, set to 1. Similarly, B would have the 1th index set to 1. And Z will have like the 25th index set to 1. That's basically what one-hot encoding is. right? So now we've turned our words to numbers. Um, we've turned our characters to numbers. Um, what are we going to do with it? So we're going to look at the words using a word-level convolutional network. We're going to look at characters separately using a character level convolutional neural net. And then we're going to use an optional MLP layer for a few points boost in performance. Um, depending on the data set, it is based on this paper given below. So if you're interested, I've sh I'll share the slides. So you can look at that link. Look at the paper if you want to learn more about the network architecture and the choices there. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions on it later on. Let's look at the word level CNN. So in the word level CNN, what we're basically doing is we're creating a kind of image. Let's say we're stacking word vectors one over the other, and then we're performing convolutions over, over them. So, and if you see, the, 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 width of, the width of the window is set to the embedding width. So basically, what you're doing is unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams at the word level. That's basically what you're doing. So, so in case if you're looking at the sentence, this is a test, the first filter looks at this, the word this itself, alone. The second one look at, looks at this is, is a, and so on and so forth. And the third one looks at this is a, at three words at a time. So it's one word at a time, two words at a time, and three words at a time. Right? Intuitively very similar. Like Intuitively it's the same as bigrams, trigrams, and unigrams. Character level CNN. Similarly for characters, we looked at, look at characters in groups of three, fours, and five each. Um, this helps us analyze words. And this stage is important intuitively from the perspective of trying to get misspellings, trying to catch misspellings. So it's, if you write shit with like an exclamation mark, this is the stage that will help, help it understand that, oh, well, like, you know, 
something's wrong. Now, we have the word level CNN, we have the character level CNN. Now, we need to put it all together, right? So let's see how we put it all together. This is the block diagram of the system. So the input given is this is a test. You have a splitter which separates the words and the, and the characters. So for the, for the word level, one second, let me try to get a pointer up there. So for the word level model, the inputs will be this. So you, take, you separate the strings by word pass it through the word embedding model so you'd have a window or like a stack of word embeddings corresponding to this is row one, row zero corresponds to this, row one corresponds to is, row two corresponds to A, and row right. Now, same for one hot encoding, you separate each character, use spaces, and like your character set can also include special symbols like exclamation marks, um, and whatever symbols you decide to use. You can also use this for emoji classification because again, it's still the same. It's still a character set. Um, depending on your data, you could get exciting results with that as well. Uh, and then the word, the output, like the word level preprocessing goes to the word level CNN, the character level preprocessing goes to the character level CNN, and then the outputs of each CNN, like the three filters, is pooled, so you do pooling over it, and then you generate a flat vector. You do pooling over the character levels, and you do a, you generate a flat vector, and then in the end, you can add the optional MLP that I talked about, or you can just put a softmax layer and get the outputs over it. This is everything put together. I put in a code slide to make it seem legit. Uh, <laughs> so this is where we build the word level CNN, the car level CNN. There's concatenation happening of the pooled outputs. And this is the optional MLP. And you, outputs are taken over a softmax. And that is just Kara's boilerplate. OK, building and training the model. Now, we use Python, of course. It's Python, so we use Python to build and train the model. Um, we use Keras to make it readable and you know better and we use tensorflow as a back end now um, those who are familiar with the keras library might know that you can use you know different back ends so if you do not like keras and you're like oh, if you do not like tensorflow and if you're like oh i want to use pytorch like keras has a pytorch back end it also has theano and a bunch of others i'm not sure what the updated support list is um, we divide we did a 25 75 split and we achieved 96 performance, 96% accuracy on the test data, which was state of the art. The paper that we've cited talks about 93, but we got 96. Um, all right, so let's look at this from an organizational perspective. The, re the research team has solved the problem. They're super happy, they're celebrating, right? Now, you take the, the product team finds out, and they're like, awesome, let's include it in the product. The product team is like super thrilled about it. They're like, awesome, let's you know, build something about it. Now, the developers, they're like, how the hell do we do that? <laughs> um, the ops team or the infrastructure guys, they're like, how the hell do we deploy, deploy this clunky piece of shit? <laughs> All right, so the solution, expose the model via a dockerized microservice. So basically, enclose everything inside a nice looking Docker container, have a RESTful endpoint, um, and then host, I mean, it's dependent, independent of the host environment since it's using Docker. Uh, that's what, that, that, those goodnesses come from Docker. And then there, we, we also build an end-to-end -end audit system. And this framework can also be extended or like with, with very we can also, encapsulate any other Keras model. So even if a Keras model does image classification, it can be used to encapsulate that as well. And there's configurable logging. So simple modifications to the Python logging module, and we build functionality around that. So why Docker? Um, as I said, Docker encloses everything in a very good looking, like in a very reproducible manner, and like makes it independent of the host. But that's a caveat, right? Containers. That's a caveat because if you're using GPUs, 
NVIDIA GPUs, you're going to have, you're, you'll be compelled to install the relevant drivers on your host OS. Like installing that inside, GPU won't work, GPUs won't work, but apart from that, if you're using CPU inferences, containers work seamlessly. But with GPUs, you'll have to do extra stuff. <coughs> Again, end to end auditability. So the idea is that as soon as a request comes in, you need to know what happened, what the outputs of the request at each stage were. So like when the request comes in, we basically implemented a system where each incoming request was assigned a UUID and then modules, each module, so like the word splitter, the character splitter, everything was um, logging, like was logging the relevant outputs. And we also made sure to, in order to protect privacy, we log hashes of IO instead of the IO itself. Um, so that, you know, it helps in compliance, it helps from a compliance perspective and with GDPR, that becomes even more important. And the logging system, we built the logging system using the Python logging module. So the different built-in logging levels and all of that good stuff stayed in. An important point to note here is that we can use, like we can also manage logging via Docker. So you just print a standard out from your container and then get wire your container output to any other channel that you want. You can. We use we we tried it with Fluentd and it works via Docker. You can just redirect that output to any logging uh, solution of your choice. All right, implementation diagram. So you have a RESTful interface, a neat RESTful interface built using Flask, Django, Twisted, whatever you want, even GoLang. I mean, it should do the job, right? And then. There's a logging module on top, and then there's an input splitter, and then it goes to the word embedding model and the, and the one-hot encoder, and then it goes to that combined deep neural net classifier that we saw on the earlier slides, and the outputs in each case, case are logged, and the classifier pr predictions are returned to the RESTful interface, and the prediction is returned to the user. Um, so this is how we implemented it in a nutshell, and our system is ready to use. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Yeah, the, at the end of the day, for the labels, uh, how did you extract the labels? Using Amazon Mechanical Turk and the seed, or you also did some other steps? Um, so Mechanical Turk was, we did use that, but like I said, it's important to curate the data. So what we did was we used Mechanical Turk as one of the, one of the things, so we took an amalgamation of different data sets. We use different data sets. We use Mechanical Turk for assigning labels. And we also use certain other open source data sets. But yeah, Mechanical Turk is a very helpful um, solution. And if you're doing it in an enterprise setting, there's also um, higher quality data available than Mechanical Turk. Because Mechanical Turk, the workforce, you have no idea about the people annotating it. Higher quality annotation, solu annotation solutions are available, so you might use them as well. They're slightly more pricey, but they're helpful from an enterprise perspective. And especially if you're working with production data, you'd want that because you do not want to put PII out there on Mechanical Turk, right? So you would want a more controlled solution. For Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, you can use like one single person or you can have like multiple persons. I would, I would prefer to have multiple people. Because, I mean, again, it's, it's a trade-off that you need to balance because it costs money to get data annotated. And multiple people means you're increasing the cost, cost threefold, fourfold, or n-fold, right? So, I mean, it's a trade-off that you need to balance. So if it's like a very critical application, I would go with a consensus mechanism. Uh, but if it's like pretty straightforward, I want you to do the job. Okay. Um, I've noticed that the, the example code that you the data that you ask for it to sentences. Uh -huh. Does this system work well with non pets, uh, large ball of pets? That's a good question. So the, the way the system works is uh, dependent on your training data, of course. So a hack that we used was we divided a given chunk of data into multiple sequences of smaller chunks. And so if you take, let's say you, let's assume you're training on Twitter, right? So you train with 140 max, 140 characters max. Right? And on, on, at the word level, let's give, it, give you 100, right? You're never going to touch that limit, but let's give you 100, right? 
you do 100 words, and then now when you have to use that to analyze text which are like 500 words long, you just divide it into chunks of, continuous chunks of like 100 words each, and then if any one of them is offensive, then the text is offensive. Not the best way to do it, but it works. Uh, how well would your system work with your talk that you just gave? As in, does it understand when you quote? Because you quoted some really offensive stuff. Mm -hmm. On purpose, of course. Yeah. And in context, that's okay. But does it handle, like, quote it? If, I, if, if, you, if it would filter tweets, for example, if I tweeted something horrible, like this person said, mm -hmm. insert offensive stuff, would it flag as offensive or not? So that's a good question, uh, and, and answer, the answer to that depends on multiple um, factors. So one factor would be, because look, if you're looking at a sentence, you do not capture the context of a conversation, right? So I can give you an exchange, which like, okay, let's say, let's take this example exchange, right? Person A says, what did you have for breakfast? Person B says, your mom. Now when you look at, <laughs> When you look at sentence one, it is not offensive by itself. When you look at sentence two independently, it is not offensive by itself. But when you put it together, it is pretty terrible, right? So now it just, again, machine learning is not magic. It depends on how you structure your input data. So if you fed that conversation, uh, then it is gonna pick that up. And coming to your point about quoting. Now, in quoting, if you say, he said, blah, 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 then yes, that should be fine. If you classify that as offensive, or he said, or he exclaimed, or exclaimed, maybe not, but he said, or he shared, um, if you start with something like that and then put it in, inside inverted quotes, this system will pick that up, but the system will not pick up the give and take, unless it has been explicitly you know, trained to learn that. Like, the per like, because conversation analysis is not the same as text analysis. Conversation has other dimensions that are not accounted for. So this system will work on independent texts, but not on conversations. How many languages support? What? How many languages support? How many languages? It detects how many offensive words in different languages. How many language of the offensive word it will support? I mean, like does it work only in English or Spanish or Spanish or German? No, it works. I mean, if you have a word embedding model for it. And if you have a character embedding model for it? Okay. Um, is it sensitive to a Unicode attack where you're using like a character in like Cyrillic or something like that? It would, would that mess up the one hot encoder? Um, so it depends on what your one hot encoding space is. Um, if you've included Unicode, yes, otherwise it just gets filtered out. You just use an unknown character, you just use unk. So let's say you have, you support capital. So small letters and capital letters, but you do not support exclamation marks. So you always have a space in the end for an unk, and you do a Unicode attack, it just goes on unk. Okay, probably a lot of questions here. Um, so you tell that the language is different models and the predictions. Um, do you run for yourself or you use any cloud provider for that? Um, I have a good GPU. So when I'm training, I get it done locally, and running inference is on the cloud. So there are two parts to it, right? One is training. When you're training, I just do it locally, and, and I don't even use Docker when I'm doing that. But when I'm running it, like when I'm running inferences, I would push it to the cloud. I would, I mean, poison of choice, whatever. Okay, so does it make sense to switch the serverless model? Because uh, you didn't have to run any Docker, you didn't have to run a Kubernetes, but you can switch to any service model because fairly those models you mentioned, they're fairly small, like, like half, half a mega, thousand megabytes. Yeah. So you can put it on the serverless and it can it, it give you more power than even containers. We tried serverless. The problem with serverless is warm starts. So to load, the model can run into gigs to load that into memory is gonna take a very long time. So if you want to run serverless, you, you're gonna have to keep warming up your instance and that, I mean, you can do that, you can leverage that, but it's not very helpful because the very idea of serverless is on-demand compute. And if you need to keep warming it up, then you're probably, you know. And again, with if you have like multiple shards, like AWS gives you what, multiple, 
um, multiple instances, multiple threads behind Lambda, it gives you that option, right? So you have to warm each thing up. And warming up is a problem. So warm starts are a problem. We tried leveraging serverless, but it doesn't help because of this warm starts. But if you can, um, if you could take the word embeddings out, which does the word embeddings and splitting for you, and then if you can reduce your neural net to like a series of vector multiplications, then it could work in a serverless setting. But as it is, uh, replacement for for this factor. Since so all, all models are that big, so what? More than, more, all, all those models are big when you send like more than one gigabyte. Oh, more than that, like. Word embedding, a pre-trained word embedding model over like an entire corpus can be can go into like gigabytes. It can go into like four or five gigabytes. Pre-trained embedding models are huge, so serverless is probably not the best way. But if you like, like I said, if you um, are take it out of the model and put it into the data processing pipeline, you might be able to use serverless. But again, Keras and TensorFlow have a long warm-up time, so again, you would have to use some sort of reduced matrix computation. So like r basically write, write Golang to perform those matrix um, calculations on those weights. Then, then it might but in the current form, not really. And that there would be issues with maintainability in, the, in that case. So it, just, it all depends on what, you're, you know, what you want, what you're out to achieve. Because if you change the network structure, everything's going to change. You'd have to rewrite the matrix multiplication all over again. All right, let's give big thanks for Elisha.